Food is fuel for your body, your mind, and definitely your sport. But let's face it, nutrition is confusing and the expectations on girls and women to be thin and have a six pack are exhausting. If you've ever been frustrated with your body, confused about nutrition, obsessed with eating healthy or guilty when you don't, underate, overate, or overtrained and overwhelmed with all the pressure, then this podcast is for you. Nutrition can be easy. You can take control of it, but it might start with letting go of control by asking for help and making a change. I'm Lindsay Elizabeth Cortez, sports dietitian and owner of Rise Up Nutrition, where I empower female athletes to overcome nutrition concerns and perform at their highest level, to stop being confused by all the mixed or harmful messages, and finally have confidence in your body as a fierce, fit, and fueled female athlete. Welcome, fans. I have another great guest today. Her name is Dr. Emily Krauss. She specializes in physical medicine and rehabilitation sports medicine and takes a unique approach to the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of sports injuries in athletes of all ages. She's currently a clinical assistant professor at Stanford Children's Orthopedic and Sports Medicine Center. She's involved in multiple Stanford IRB-approved research projects, including the Healthy Runner Project, a multi-center prospective interventional study focused on bone stress injury prevention in collegiate, middle, and long-distance runners. Dr. Krauss also spends time performing gait analysis at the Stanford Run Safe Injury Prevention Program and serves as a medical advisor for the Adaptive Sports Injury Prevention Program at Palo Alto VA. She has research and clinical interests in endurance sports medicine, injury prevention, running biomechanics, and the prevention of bone stress injuries in collegiate athletes, and the promotion of health and wellness at any age of life. Emily herself has completed nine marathons, including Boston Marathon twice and 150K Ultra Marathon. With running and staying physically active as one of her personal passions, she recognizes the importance of fitness for overall well being and the prevention of chronic medical conditions. Emily, welcome so much to the Female Athlete Nutrition Podcast. Lindsay, thank you for having me. It's an honor. Yeah. You know, you obviously, what a great bio. You have done so much, you know, as a physician and a specialist in bone health. And I feel like you and I, you know, both being runners and I think your background, you really pay so much special attention to things like energy deficiency and the female and male athlete triad and how that can impact our health, our well-being, our sport, our bones. And so I just think we have so much in common and I'm really excited to talk with you, somebody who really specializes on the bone piece. Yes. It's always nice to chat with a fellow, fellow bonehead as I, as I joke, but it's, you know, I think we come from that, that background where an injury to a bone is, is really frustrating and devastating to, to a runner and trying to understand ways to reduce that injury risk and understand how to optimize the healing both today and just throughout our life is, is really important. And I feel like through our, through our running community, through the, our clients and patients that we work with, it just is so, so fresh on our mind all of, all of the time that being able to have the latest research and have the best explanations and ways to educate our, our patients and athletes is, is really valuable. So this, this podcast is a great example of that. Yeah, for sure. And, and like you said too, like this bone injuries in, in athletes and, and runners, I don't know if this is specifically, or if this is just what I'm exposed to, but we see it so often. And I think one of the really interesting thing about bone injuries is like, you don't know necessarily that it's coming, you know? So it's so sad when runners are just running and they think they're fine. They think they're fine. And then bam, like stress fracture. And it's like, the reality is with bone, this is something that potentially not in every situation with bone, but potentially this has been an underlying problem, just unrecognized, you know? Yeah. And I think that's the most, sometimes the most, sometimes the most frustrating for an athlete is, oh, nobody told me that I should have been doing these things during high school or during collegiate training. And I think that first injury, that first bone stress injury or um, also um, stress reaction or stress fracture is really eye-opening for those athletes. And I think from my experience, the, the athletes that are really willing to sit down and change maybe some of those, those training habits or fueling habits can really turn their turn that injury risk around. But it does take does take work. And sometimes 
the tapping into maybe some more personal questions. Yeah. Yeah. So to kind of kick us off while we have an expert here, I was wondering if you could give us like the bone health 101 <laughs> like of how does bone work? Because I know as silly as it might sound, I might have some people listening who like in their brain, because maybe this is what my brain once thought, you know, we little Lindsay, that like bone is just like this hard thing in your body. It's just like a rock. Like, can you explain to our listeners how a live bone is and maybe like just the basics of bone growth or bone loss throughout a lifetime? Yes. Lindsay, I will try not to spend the rest of the hour talking about this. <laughs> I feel like I could really nerd out on bone health and bone 101, but we'll just, we'll start with lecture number one. And if we want to expand on this later, if there are follow up questions, happy to do that. Okay. So I think starting off with um, kind of understanding what bone remodeling is, is it is really important. So it's not like we have this static piece of bone that just grows with length throughout our life, our our bones are constantly remodeling. So they're breaking down and they're reforming. And there are certain times in our life where that increases or decreases. And oftentimes with, with running or different weight-bearing exercise and or load, that can lead to changes in that the potential of that remodeling. And it can be really healthy. So a, a runner or someone who's, especially someone who's engaging in like multi-directional sports is actually helping build their bones. So it's really, really helpful. Oftentimes with younger athletes, I encourage um, doing different sports and engaging in weight-bearing sports because it can be really beneficial for just overall bone growth and bone, bone density and bone remodeling potential. Now, sometimes that bone breakdown or bone formation can be adjusted or can be altered. And there are a lot of different causes for that. There are a number of different hormones circulating throughout our body that influence that bone remodeling potential. We can get into that a little bit now. There's growth hormones and sex hormones that that can um, affect that kind of bone breakdown and increase bone breakdown. And specifically, some hormones, when they're lower or less circulating throughout our body, that can really increase the risk of vulnerability of the bone. So I'm kind of getting into some t- discussions about that relative energy deficiency and low energy availability. And we can maybe tap into that a little bit more because I feel like that's kind of another explanation. But there are different things that we can do that can really affect that bone remodeling. I think it's also important to talk about in Bone Health 101 how important adolescent growth is to kind of contribute to our overall bone mineral density. Peak bone mass is attained really during childhood and adolescence, and that's a major determinant of bone mass and fracture risk throughout our life. I know what a lot of the listeners are probably not in their adolescence years. And so there are other ways to just maintain that bone mass that they have, but really um, encouraging the younger athletes that this is their time to really optimize their fueling and nutrition to optimize that remodeling potential, as well as engage in weight-bearing sports and resistance exercise are ways to just overall influence and improve overall bone health. And then It is interesting that these increased estrogen levels, specifically in females, they reduce certain types of the bone breakdown, and they actually really contribute to that bone remodeling. And it's also important to realize that if that's affected through like poor impaired nutrition, that can really affect just overall bone health. So I feel like that's where we can start. And if you have specific questions, we can go into like diagnoses such as low bone mineral density and the scary word of osteoporosis. But I'll, I'll, I'll pause and see if you want to pivot in any direction based on what I've shared so far. Well, that was really great. And what I think is really interesting too, for, for somebody who maybe doesn't have any knowledge of bone, when they're probably thinking, how do I improve bone health? Their mind probably thinks, oh, I'll take a calcium supplement. And those words did not come out of your <laughs> mouth just now. What you said for bone health was basically hormones play a huge role and then also proper training and load bearing exercise and multi-directional sports and probably just proper proper training. Those are the two big things I heard and and by no means are we discounting calcium, but like to just be taking a calcium supplement and assume that your bones are good is is not the most important thing. Exactly. And I think a lot of our a lot of the nutrients that we need and I'm sure you can attest to this can be obtained from our diet and Oftentimes, I mean, I do encourage like daily 
calcium and vitamin D through food. Sometimes that's through dairy. Um, Some people have dairy intolerances, so there are other ways to do that. But I really try to avoid blindly supplementing or using supplementation with calcium and vitamin D unless there is an, an obvious deficiency. Or especially, or if there is an injury, and we might want to just boost those levels um, to just optimize that bone remodeling. Yeah. So let's get into the hormone stuff here because that's what you're saying. Some some key hormones regulate bone remodeling, which is the process of it. Both, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Bone remodeling encompasses the process of bone growth and bone loss, kind of constantly happening throughout your life life and the balance of the two. And so this is where we've, we've said the words female athlete triad and energy deficiency, relative energy deficiency in sport. And so for our listeners, just a quick overview of that, you know, the female athlete triad is essentially, and male, actually, I should correct myself. It is female and male athlete triad is sort of the relationship between low energy intake with or without an eating disorder In females, amenorrhea or a lack of a menstrual cycle. And in males, just low male hormones, sex hormones. And the third piece of that would be altered bone health and lower bone mineral density. And the kind of triad between those three things that can greatly affect an athlete. And they all are interconnected, right? So go ahead and tell us a little bit, Emily, if you can, about how how the hormones and energy intake then impact our bones. Yeah, that's, first of all, great, great description of the female athlete triad. That, that was perfect. I just gave a lecture to um, our orthop- orthopedics department this week on the triad and relative energy deficiency in sport. And it's, it's always really fun to kind of go back and see the course. And so the triad was coined, the term was coined in the early 1980s and really has just kind of evolved over the last 30 years and as the research has kind of contributed to that definition. But really at the heart of the triad is this low energy availability. Sometimes it can be unintentional. Sometimes it can be intentional with it with disordered eating or an eating disorder. But all of that can be really harmful to our body. And so just to kind of break it down as far as the hormones, so that low energy availability from oftentimes under fueling, overtraining, or a combination of of the two affects the release of certain hormones from our hypothalamus. Specifically, it's called gonadotropic releasing hormone, and it suppresses that release. And that, so the body then gets into this energy conservation mode. And so it starts to suppress the release of hormones to certain parts of the body, specifically reproductive hormones. So that leads to drops in estrogen, that leads to drops in testosterone, both in males and females. But it also has suppressive effects to other organs, such as our thyroid function. And that can lead to drops in our overall metabolic rate. And so the influence on the bones is kind of multifold from all these different areas, including the the sex hormones and the thyroid function. And so that leads to suppression of bone formation, increased bone breakdown. And then there are these other hormones, too, that are suppressed from that low energy availability. And we can really nerd out and talk about the changes in leptin. There's decreases in leptin. There's insulin is is suppressed and that also has effects on on our bones. So in addition to that those sex hormones that we talked about, there are all these other hormones that are affected and it leads to elevations in our cortisol levels. So our stress hormones go up too. So I think it's it's just really important to think about all the negative consequences of low energy availability beyond the triad. And that's kind of a nice segue into this expansion of the triad definition into um, relative energy deficiency in sport, which was coined around 2014 by the International Olympic Committee. And that just kind of takes into account all the other physiological and performance consequences of low energy availability. So it's just really important. And I I feel like it's just so underappreciated early on in athletes training, how valuable fueling can be, not just for their overall bone health, but also for just performance and recovery and all these other and their metabolism. For sure. And I think, you know, to tie in what you said earlier, that our bone growth is really key during adolescent years. And also, that re- some reproductive hormones play such a huge role in our bone growth. And so I just want to go ahead and say it that for any teen or adolescent or college kid that might be listening to this podcast and is thinking, but I don't care about reproduction. I don't care about fertility. 
who cares if I have estrogen? Gosh, I really wish I would cry less anyways. <laughs> that it extends beyond just, you know, estrogen giving us feelings and for reproduction. And it's actually incredibly helpful for the growth of your bones. And that's like just a huge message that we want to get across both um, Dr. Krauss and myself today. Yeah. And you just raise a good point about just like periods. And I, one thing that I just want to emphasize and especially both in males and females is that what some of the signs of this low energy availability in those, especially in those younger years, one of the signs could be a change in menstrual status or change in um, periods. So this could be a complete loss of period. It could be a delay in an athlete's first period. So 15 is really the age when we start to think about, okay, why isn't this athlete, why isn't this athlete got, had her first period or what, what's the cause for this delayed puberty? And there can be a number of different causes beyond low energy availability, but I think it's important to really start to ask those questions. And then there's can be even just changes in menstrual cycle. So maybe the period gets really light from that lower hormone, so low, those lower sex hormones. And then in males, it's it's just more challenging to to screen for and test for. And so things like kind of change in change in libido or um, sex drive, change in loss of morning erections, change in kind of facial hair growth are some some signs that should be asked by a clinician if there are questions about the male athlete triad and some hormonal suppression. Yeah, you know, and with this being the the female athlete nutrition podcast, I still think it's important to bring up the male things. And I also want to say like, this is definitely one area where like women and girls can be grateful that we have a period and a monthly signal to tell us if things are okay, because it honestly sounds harder for the male. So I'm going to like weirdly take that as some sort of win for like, <laughs> of like, yes. Hey, this is easier for us, you know, cause that's really hard for them to, to diagnose versus a girl has her period. And then it goes away for a few months. Like I have a red flag, you know, let me go investigate this further. And I always tell my clients, cause a lot of my clients do come to me with this problem. I'm like, okay, we don't need, to, you know, there's no reason to freak out. Like now we have the information and the data of, we have a signal of something going wrong internally. Like thank goodness we have that signal because now we can do something about it. Now we can have an intervention, which I guess we could kind of move to next. You know, I'll go ahead and say first as a dietitian and somebody who focuses on the nutrition side of this, I, I already kind of know your answer because I know you, but um, so <laughs> I, um, I definitely focus on, we'll start fueling right, you know, from a nutrition standpoint, start fueling right, recover from the energy deficiency. And that in and of itself will raise your hormones and then raise your bone health. But I'd love to hear it from you, the bone specialist. Like when somebody comes to your clinic and are, are showing these signs and having these problems, like what is the step-by-step -step process, if, if possible, for you to share that with us of how to start improving bone health when somebody is showing signs of female athlete triad, energy deficiency, and maybe lack of hormones? Yeah. Yes. First of all, I mean, like to get to the, to kind of cut to the chase, I fully support and agree with that, that, that approach. But with, when they come into my clinic, I also, I also need to figure out is the low energy availability the cause or is there something else going on? So why is this athlete losing her period and, or having some type of hormonal suppression? And there are other causes such as polycystic ovarian syndrome, pregnancy, other chronic diseases, thyroid dysfunction, and those can have different lab profiles. So making sure that you have the right diagnosis is really helpful because the treatments do change, especially if somebody has polycystic ovarian syndrome. Oftentimes you do want to consider some type of hormonal replacement. And with an athlete with low energy availability from just under fueling and loss of period through that, it's important to not put that athlete on um, oral contraceptive pills because it can sometimes mask and give this false sense of security on regular periods. And so I think kind of educating and taking or clarifying some misconceptions about what the types of treatments that are appropriate and necessary is really, really important. I think a lot of athletes who come to see me are already on the pill or were told to be put on the pill by their by their coach or by another by another athlete. So trying to 
talk about, is it, is it time for an athlete to be off the pill or what's the reason for being on the pill? If they were on the pill just because of irregular periods, because they're missing their period during higher intensity training blocks, that's probably not the right reason. And we need to kind of go back to the drawing board and um, investigate further. If they're on their periods for birth control, then we need to talk about other ways to make sure that they're getting that optimal energy balance through appropriate nutrition. So I'm really lucky to, so say we kind of get to that diagnosis of female athlete triad, low energy availability from under fueling. I'm fortunate to have um, sports dietitians that I can refer these athletes to. And oftentimes I really like to have a close conversation with those dietitians because sometimes it does get to a point where we need to think about kind of expanding our team, especially if there are some disordered eating concerns. Oftentimes that we really need a mental health specialist and more closer monitoring because the overall medical consequences of letting that disordered eating then get to an eating disorder is, is a really, is a very different animal. And I, I really, I think one of my passions and goals is to avoid an athlete getting to that point. And it's, it's more than just telling them to eat more. It's kind of tapping into, you know, why, what, what's holding you back from fueling properly? Is there a body image concern? Are you trying to compare yourself to, to, to other athletes? And I think that's really hard, especially in the, in the culture of running and especially in a younger athlete who is trying to kind of get, feel good in their own skin, but still feels these others kind of social pressures that can be, it can be hard. And it's, and sometimes you really have to kind of, kind of peel that onion gently. And it might not be that first or second appointment to really kind of tap into some of those deeper feelings and questions that they might have been suppressing for, for a long time. And I hear a lot just kind of seeing stories that have come out from athletes in their maybe college or even post-college years about their struggles with disordered eating, but they didn't realize it was disordered eating. They thought it was just normal, normal for, for training for their, for their sport. And I think changing that culture early, and this is a great example of that, informing those, those listeners and those coaches and athletes and athletic trainers and even just other, other clinicians and physicians is, is a good start to just recognize these signs and symptoms early so they don't progress to that point. Because when it progresses to that point, it's the bad, scary stress fracture that maybe is more of a higher risk location, like of the sacrum or femoral neck. And that takes lo- a lot longer to heal. And oftentimes it's, it can lead to other injuries down the road because there's some underlying impaired bone health that needs to be addressed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. I just feel like you're reading my mind. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Same page. <laughs> yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent. And I really like that you just told our listeners to the importance, like, like, the importance of getting to the root cause, because as much as I love the education that, you know, people like you, me, and so many other people have been putting out there recently. And and I know, you know, hundreds of thousands of people still haven't heard it yet, but we do want to educate people on fueling properly and the importance of menstrual cycles. But also I really appreciate that you said, wait, there's multiple causes. Okay. So just because your period went away doesn't, doesn't automatically mean I have an eating disorder. Like we're not jumping to that conclusion. There could be other underlying things going on. And that's why talking to a professional is important. There's many reasons for hormone imbalances. And yeah, we see in athletes energy deficiency a lot, but it could also be from something else. So go talk to a professional get help and figure out what the the root cause of it is so that you can follow the correct treatment plan. And with that, I would love to kind of shift into what are some medical treatment plans that might be appropriate. And I do want to stick to the topic of red S. Maybe I can even just throw a case study at your way. That's helpful. Let's say that we have, we'll say a college athlete. So this is, you know, she's got four years to, to really compete. And she's been missing her period for, we'll go with a couple years now. She's starting to work on her nutrition, but the reality is we're very nervous of a bone fracture. Maybe she's already got low bone mineral density. I'm curious in a case like that, you know, is, is there a place for hormonal treatment and therapies? Because as I said, I have a big push for doing things naturally, restoring your natural cycle, but would it be, is it possible to get hormonal treatment and medical treatment as well? 
Uh, Lindsay, this is a great question. And I think that if you ask a lot of sports medicine docs, they may have some, some different answers to this. I think step one is well, like once you've established the why the athlete is losing their period, I think that's, and if it's from that kind of relative energy deficiency state, then it is a step one is to optimize nutrition through a nutrition program. Usually this is kind of more consistent, whether it's weekly, every other week, meeting with someone, really kind of checking the each day to make sure that that fueling is matching the output, that energy output. And maybe that athlete cannot maintain that amount of fueling and they may need to dial back on their training right now just to ensure that they're getting that optimal energy balance. And sometimes, as you probably have experienced with athletes in this relative energy deficient state, their metabolism is suppressed. So it may take a while for those hormones to to normalize. So I think giving a good amount of time to see how the body responds, and it's not going to happen overnight in the next week, in the next month. Sometimes it does, especially if the period or loss of period or amenorrhea is a little kind of more shorter term. So maybe it lost their period for a few months, maybe they'll um, resume that probably more more quickly. But in those cases where it's been years, it may be months, up to six months before resumption of that period. And so I really discourage early hormonal therapies. And as I had mentioned before, putting an athlete on an oral contraceptive pill does not help with bone health, does not give enough hormones to really kind of set the body straight. I mean, it's a little bit, but it actually can complicate matters with the, um, especially the oral contraceptive pill. The Depo-Provera shot actually can be harmful for bone health. So I think that's important to realize is that if that, that athlete is on that, that type form of birth control or hormonal contraception, um, they should probably get off of that. And then there are instances where it can be beneficial to help boost that bone mineral density through the estrogen patch or transdermal estrogen with cyclic progestin. Oftentimes, I won't even have that discussion until that athlete is fully on board with the nutrition intervention plan because I don't want that estrogen patch to be a band-aid for the bigger issue down, down the road because ultimately, it will help preserve some bone mineral density, but the best is to get back on a good nutrition plan and get those hormones, their own hormones flowing and at a good um, balance. And that's really going to help them and their sport and in performance as well. Perfect. So, so again, we're on the same page here. Number one, address the nutrition. Number two, address the training. And then number three, consider hormonal therapies, but you have to be fully committed to one and two at the same time and have given that good effort. And then when you do consider hormonal therapies, they are not equally created. So they're all very different, right? And it's, and I think in the case of bone health too, we want to remember like, you know, birth control when we're thinking of the traditional pill, oral contraceptive, like that's, that's a contraceptive. It is birth control. It is not build my bones. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It is not build my bones pill. (laughs) It is is to prevent pregnancies. And so that's why these things are not all created equal. There are hormonal treatments that can help your bones, but it's very different than just taking quote unquote birth control. I think the caveat is this is still, this still needs to be studied. And studying the female athlete and trying to get a really good, well-designed study for an athlete on on birth control. There are really great researchers out in the world, Kirstie Elliott Sell, who's doing a lot of research on different types of hormonal contraception for performance and injuries and a lot of things. But I think the reality is we're still figuring this out. And what from based on the studies that we have so far, this is what we the information we can provide. But there's a lot of humility in medicine and my my recommendations will evolve. I know they will, but I'm, I'm excited to see see where things are going. And I think, like you said, there's a really there are some really important, good, like well implemented number one and number two that you need to start with. Yeah, really, really good point. And I, I love that being humble enough to say medicine is changing. Maybe we don't have all the answers. This is what we know right now. It might change in the future. And this is a great segue into some of the research that you do. Specifically right now, you have something called the Healthy Runner Project. 
And again, this is an IRB approved research project where you're looking at bone stress injury in collegiate and middle collegiate, middle and long distance runners. There we go. I said that right. So I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about that. Like what are some things that you're specifically trying to analyze in this research? When will this research be done? um, Is some of it already completed? (laughs) Oh man. So Lindsay, this, the healthy runner project is a, is a, is research that I had the opportunity to get involved with during my residency year. So I've been involved for the past eight or so years. The principal investigators are Michael Fredrickson at Stanford and Aurelia Nativ at UCLA, who are really um, pioneers in studying bone health and triad males and females. And um, like you said, the, the aim is really to reduce bone stress injury rates. And so we've been exploring ways to do this through using this uh, cumulative risk assessment tool that uses its actually called the Female Athlete Triad Cumulative Risk Assessment Tool that's been created to really help screen these athletes that might be at higher risk of the triad. Um, but we're also, we also got um, DEXA bone mineral density scans on athletes and did hormonal testing each year. And so over the course of eight years, there was a period of kind of retrospective chart review that we really explored all the different kind of just baseline data for from UCLA and Stanford. And I do have that data, actually. So when I was in residency, I was in charge of doing the retrospective chart review, where I was like combing through all the charts through our medical records. And this was on 133 D1 distance runners over three years. And we found that female gender was associated with three times the risk of bone stress injury during those collegiate years. Higher BMI was associated with a decreased rate of bone stress injury. And then history of history of bone stress injury was associated twice the risk of future. So, and just kind of the overall impaired bone health um, question. But was what was really alarming for me was that 35% of females sustained stress fractures over those three years. And distribution of those stress fractures were at high or bone stress injuries were at high risk sites. So the femoral neck and the sacrum comprised 23% of those stress fractures. And those aren't, those aren't fractures that stress fractures that you can just kind of respond to or recover from in a few weeks. That's, you know, six, eight plus weeks of recovery and not running. It can really um, just take an athlete out of a season. So that was some of our preliminary data. And now we've been doing these screening tools with, um, so the intervention part of our study now is a nutrition intervention, which you will appreciate. And the primary nutrition intervention is really to optimize energy balance. And to not get too much into the weeds, optimal energy availability is calculated based on healthy exercising females. And they use a balance of 45 kilocals per kilogram of fat-free mass per day. And we won't get into the full ex- explanation of defining low energy availability, but that's kind of the goal with 30, 30 being the kind of the low, low energy availability range. And then the secondary intervention is just to continue to follow all these vitamin D and thyroid and testosterone and estrogen and all these other hormone levels. So we don't have our final analysis yet, but the preliminary, (laughs) the preliminary, I can't wait for it. (laughs) We do have some preliminary data and we did find that these risk assessment tools are help predict prospective bone stress injury. So these higher cumulative risk assessment scores were associated with a delay in return to sport in athletes who sustained a stress fracture. And they actually also predicted future stress fracture with each additional point increasing risk by about 13%. And so these questions, the cumulative risk assessment tool is like asking questions about um, menstrual cycle or periods. There is a DEXA scan question, a history of stress fracture question, BMI, history of disordered eating. And I actually use this tool in my clinic to help explain to an athlete their current risk profile, whether it's an athlete who came to me with a stress fracture or an athlete that I'm just really concerned about because they're kind of going down, down in that direction to just be like, Hey, this is your risk. And we really need to do something. Or the consequence is going to be another stress fracture or a more severe stress fracture. 
The, yeah, this is so huge. And to have the actual number and percentage risk increase is, this is why research is so important because it, it's the same for me, right? When I have a client, I'm doing the same thing in, in my own way of notes and, you know, my mental charting of, okay, this is risk factor, risk factor, risk factor, you know, well, this is moderate, this is slight, whatever. But to actually have numbers associated to that and be able to compile it and say, you know, you're at a, there's a, you know, 54% chance you'll get a stress fracture in the next few years or something like that which obviously I'm just making that number up right now. But that, I mean, that's powerful information because the saddest thing that I see happen with athletes is they have all those risk factors. They're aware that they're under fueling. They're aware that they might be slightly restricting. They're aware that they're training really hard, but they've never had an injury. And so they have no reason to change their ways. And again, as you know, the professionals, you and I both, we're over here saying, but we, you've got 20 red flags, but the athlete is still saying, but I've never been injured. And we're like, well, internally, we know what's going, what path this is leading down. And so I think that's where this research to have those, that percentage risk increase would be so powerful for the athlete to be empowered with, you know, really making a change. Yeah. Oh, Lindsay, it breaks my heart to see these athletes when they're like, they think they're in their prime, their training's going well, you know, their weight just keeps dropping. And the reality is there is that, that idea that leaner is faster. And so they think they're, they've got all this competitive adva- advantage building up. And then all of a sudden they're sidelined either through a, a bad bone stress injury or even just severe fatigue and kind of that overtraining, relative energy deficiency, the other con- physiologic consequences. And it's so hard when they're in, they almost got have the blinders on and they're so focused on the final prize. They don't realize that they're flying too close to the sun. Mm, mm, yeah. It's heartbreaking. So early, and I've heard you say this before and some of the stuff you put out, just like early education, early treatment is where you can continue to train at the level you want and and have the good bones to continue to run and perform and 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 just you know the earlier you address this the better but i do say that doesn't mean just because you have a stress fracture now like the world is not over there's you can still recover you can still get treatment like and just again the sooner the better the sooner you recognize this in in yourself maybe after listening to this episode of the podcast okay. <laughs> Like get up, like get help. <laughs> yeah, like now, like I'm not joking. At any age, um, I did want to share with you. Um, so we kind of took some of those ideas with a healthy runner project, and I did a pilot study in high school runners, female high school runners, and really what I wanted to do was find if there was an association between triad and iron deficiency, because there are some like physiologic consequences of iron deficiency directly related to bone and kind of growth hormone. But what I found were the higher risk athletes, higher triad risk factors, all of them were supplementing with iron or a big a majority of them were already supplementing with iron. And so I think there are these, these misconceptions about, oh, I just need to, everybody else is supplementing with iron. My coach is telling me to supplement with iron. That's my fix. I just need to supplement with iron when they're like avoiding or not thinking about the bigger picture that they need to supplement with all sorts of nutrients and, and, and. Cal- calories. And I think it's, it's just a, a misunderstanding and things that we can do as like with our, with our voices and with our, with our practice to just um, educate that there are just kind of these, these behaviors that need to change. And I'm not saying that athletes shouldn't supplement with iron. I think there's a time and a place for it, but they shouldn't be blindly supplementing. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Yeah. It's almost like kind of what I said in the beginning of us talking together is uh, people just think bone health, I'll take calcium or I'm a runner, I'll take iron. And it's like, well, we're not addressing the the real problems here and the root problems. And if you don't know, if you haven't identified what the real problems are, you might be doing the wrong treatment and intervention plans. So I would love to hit on one other topic with you because we've talked a lot about bone injuries specific to energy deficiency or hormonal imbalances, but there is a such thing as bone injuries from, you know, improper training or overtraining or, you know, like, I don't want to be, I don't want to just assume that if you get a stress fracture, it's because you're energy deficient. That would, that would be the wrong assumption. Right. So I was wondering if you could talk about how stress fractures come about or not even stress fractures, right? Like you said before, there's stress reactions, there's 
other things that I'm not the expert on. (laughs) Yep. Yep. Yes. So, um, and such a great point about just the injury, the development of an injury and kind of asking the why and specifically with bone stress injuries. Yeah. They fall along the spectrum where there might be some like, so if we're looking at a, a, an image, an x-ray, oftentimes if an athlete comes in with shin pain and we get an x-ray, the x-ray is going to be completely normal because oftentimes it's, it's not such a, it's not a full fracture line or a full break. And so we're not going to pick that up on just a plain film. So a, a bone stress injury can be the spectrum of just some bone marrow edema or some, some different kind of the parts of the bone are, are abnormally injured, but they're not, there's not a break or an actual um, fracture line. But that's still a type of stress on the bone. And so if you keep stressing that bone kind of beyond that early edema or early inflammation, it can lead to more like deeper and more severe changes. And so if you look at an MRI, maybe there's some some changes on one some of the images, but not all the images. So that starts to increase the injury and severity. And then at the very end of that spectrum is a full is a full fracture line, where you can often see on the MRI and see on the bone. Some some athletes may have had like a, a stress fracture of one of their foot bones, like a metatarsal fracture, and oftentimes those will you can see some some fracture lines in the in the X ray. I think it's also important to kind of break down the the severity of the risk factors or severity of bone stress injuries. Based on location, there are higher risk locations, such as the the femoral neck and the sacrum, where I get a little bit more concerned about bone health than kind of overtraining. However, below the knee is kind of a mixed bag. So sometimes it's more overtraining and maybe running too much too soon as far as volume. Maybe it's kind of improper footwear. Maybe there's even some biomechanical abnormalities that we need to take a deeper dive into. There could be a small nutritional component. So usually I kind of use this like bucket analogy where we've got this injury threshold. And so you put that line on the bucket and everybody has a different bucket with a different injury threshold line. And I think that's also important to realize like an 18 year old's bucket, that injury threshold line might be a lot lower on the bucket than a professional athlete's bucket because they have years and volume and maybe some genetics that are contributing to raising that line on their bucket. Start to throw things in the bucket, like kind of overtraining through the summer, doing doubles, not taking a recovery day, improper fueling, maybe doing too many workouts, less, less easy runs. And that's all starting to raise that injury risk and getting closer to that line. And that line could be and that that bucket could be full of just training issues and and maybe some kind of impaired biomechanics but oftentimes i do see that it's it's more than that and there's some different factors and so when those athletes come in with an injury i ask all of the questions not just oh gosh it's got to be low energy availability let's optimize your nutrition i think that's missing the mark too and really not kind of taking into all of these other factors that could be contributing yeah Yeah. As you were speaking, I just had flashbacks and memories of myself in college having a stress reaction and I totally forgot about it (laughs) until just now. Wow. Just crazy. But because I think I was one of those college athletes where had, you know, probably multiple things going, multiple things going on, but it was shin, it was below the knee. And it definitely, you know, I definitely had form issues. I definitely had just jump that jump from high school athlete to college athlete is a big jump training wise. And so I think the load on my body, minor, probably nutritional concerns, which I've been fairly vocal about on my podcast and things like that too, that I myself had. And so it is interesting when when you start to have these bone injuries, just kind of the puzzle that you're putting together of, of what's the root cause and then the best way to treat it as well. It's really interesting. Yeah. And speaking of personal experiences, I'll share, share one of my, my aha moments. So I was, I was training for, I think it was my first marathon, maybe second marathon. I was training for my second marathon. It was my first year of residency I was working long hours. It was my intern year. So I was, I'm still in Nebraska training in the winter time. So that's always challenging and you're bundled up and like landing differently and doing all sorts of things and sneaking in runs early in the morning and then going into work, being on my feet and really 
not optimized. My nutrition was not optimal. I think I stopped eating. I unintentionally stopped eating red meat, was eating a lot of hospital food. No offense to um, some, some hospital cafeterias are great. No, it's fine. You're not going to offend anybody. <laughs> And I remember there was this moment, I was probably mid training cycle of this marathon and I was at the the VA in Omaha and it's just this huge building, really like so many floors. And I was rounding with my team and it's like a team of six or seven. Nobody else is training for a marathon. Nobody else is really kind of at the same running as much as I am. And so I feel like my fitness level should be a little bit better than some of those, the, the team members. And after the second or third flight of stairs, I am maybe after the first flight of stairs, I am breathing so heavy. I'm like just exhausted and I need to take a break on the flight of stairs. And I was like, I'll catch up with you. And it just dawned on me. I was like, I am anemic and I need to get a blood test. And so I got the blood test and my hemoglobin was quite low. My ferritin was in the single digits. And I had iron deficiency anemia and suffered from relative energy deficiency in, in sport. And I'm like, and I was at, even at that time really interested in sports medicine and was felt so foolish to have let myself slip into that, that stage and get, get that severe. I ended up not running that marathon, really focused on my nutrition, did burger Sundays where I ha- like would go around and go to like the best burger spot in, in Omaha and like enjoy the burger as well as eating red meat throughout the week. But that was like, like a priority burger Sunday. And, and it was, it was just this, this moment, like we're all, we're all human. We, we make errors and we learn from them. And I think we really need to kind of take those moments and, and learn and grow them from them as opposed to kind of keep going through that cycle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. No, we all, you know, nobody's perfect, even us educated and our, us professionals, but this is why knowledge is so powerful because you can see some warning signs. We've all got so much going on in our lives and so many moving parts. But when you see these red flags, when you get these warning signs, take action on them, right? Like do something about it. And that's exactly what you did. If you're training for a marathon, but you can't get up two flights of stairs, Something's wrong here. There's a problem. <laughs> There's a problem. So, who cares if you can run the marathon if you can't get up two flights of stairs? Well, Emily, this has been such a great, informative conversation. I always like to end these podcast episodes with some fun, rapid fire questions if you're down to play. Okay. <laughs> No, they're fun. Everybody gets scared. They're super fun. Okay. So if you could eat one food every single day for the rest of your life and never get sick of it, what would that be? Oh, I think ice cream. Yeah. Yep. That's like, I took that after my dad and my grandma. Ice cream. Like with like, uh, like cookies and cream or like with something in it. So maybe we can mix up the ice cream flavors, but yeah. Definitely ice cream. It is definitely a fan favorite. (laughs) <laughs> Amazing. As a somebody who's involved in sports, sports medicine, and a runner, I'm curious to know what your personal favorite sport to participate in is. Running. It's my first love. I played a lot of sports growing up, but running was always what I gravitated towards. And it's the easiest when, you're, when you have a busy week <laughs> to get out for a quick run. Yeah, absolutely. It's something you can just leave your front door and go. I think that's something I've always loved about running too. Like I like playing you know, games and actual formalized sports, but you have to like organize, like find time on the court, like running. You can just go. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Amazing. What about as a spectator? Is it still running? That's your favorite spectator sport or something else? I love to watch tennis. I grew up playing tennis and I just have all of these memories watching like Wimbledon and the U S open and something about just like the athleticism and some of these like legendary tennis players that I still really enjoy watching a, watching a tennis match, whether live or, or on TV. Wonderful. And then our final question for you is if there was a, a female athlete that really inspires you and is a role model to you, this can be somebody professional or just, you know, a, somebody, a friend or something who, what's a female athlete that you would like to give a shout out to and why? Oh man, I have so many just inspiring female athletes that are are really good dear friends. But I would have to say Laura King 
is a, a very close friend of mine, and she inspires me in a lot of different ways. Laura is, she's a mom. She's a crusher cyclist. A, her nickname is a smiling assassin. And she just finds this way to really push her body in a, in a healthy way while advocating the sport and kind of elevating the voice of other, other athletes and other female athletes. And, and she just, the way she balances her, her work and life and time with her, her little daughter, Hazel, and how she trained through her um, pregnancy in a really inspiring way that just almost raised a lot of really like important questions about like, let's, let's learn about exercise and pregnancy and kind of dispel some of the myths there. So it's just been really fun to like grow as like with our friendship and also just continue to be inspired by her, her daily, what she does on a daily basis. Beautiful. Amazing. Thank you for sharing. Well, Dr. Emily Krauss, you've dropped some amazing knowledge on us today and we're very grateful to you for that. You also continue to put Besides seeing people in your clinic, which I did mention before is based, or maybe I didn't, based in California, you also put out some great information, you know, on Instagram and on your website. And if people want to find out more about you and your research, where can they connect with you and find your stuff? Yeah. So my Instagram handle is Emily Krauss MD, and you can find, I'm also, I also do, I'm trying to do this other Emily Krauss MD underscore sports science that is a little bit more educational, but I end up um, kind of doing a lot of overlap and kind of posting a lot of stories on on both. And then I do have kind of a personal website that you can then route to kind of get a hold of me for clinical advice. And that's emilykrausmd.com. Amazing. Thank you so much. We'll include all of those links in the show notes as well. So thanks for coming on, Emily. Great conversation. Thank you, Lindsay. This was really great. Wow, what a great episode. Thank you so much for listening. I want to highlight real quick two key points. First, both Dr. Krauss and I kind of expressed how much of a puzzle this can be to figure out the root cause of bone injuries. And that is why we really want to stress the importance of working with a professional. And that is exactly what I do with so many of my clients. No, I am not treating bone directly, but how I treat bone and improve many of my clients bone status is through nutrition the power of nutrition which we did talk about through restoring you know menstrual cycles and hormones and correcting low energy availability and fueling your body with the proper nutrients you can get out of this female athlete triad or state of relative energy deficiency and start improving your bone health And the second point that I want to make is what we spoke of is to take action as soon as possible at any, you know, red flag or any one little sign that we might have touched on today, the sooner, the better earlier intervention is best before you do run into something that is more serious and tragically takes you out of your sport. So to help you out with this, please head to my website, riseupnutritionrun.com. Or if you want to see if you are at risk of red S, I have my own little handout and screening tool. You can go to riseupnutritionrun.com slash red S, that's slash R-E-D-S. You can start your red S recovery, get in touch with me, book a call, click the links in the show notes so that you are not wasting any more time in the recovery treatment care of your bone health, which will help you become a fierce, fit, and fueled female athlete. Talk to you soon.